Thank you. Thank you, Colleen. And thank you, Rutgers uh, School of Public Health for allowing me another opportunity to talk to uh, my friends and colleagues and affected people in uh, both New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. Uh, I want to say that I uh, spent many years in Bridgewater, uh, New Jersey, and my house was flooded during Hurricane Floyd and a couple of other events. So I'm speaking from experience, not to mention I've been to Boundbrook many times and, and, uh, and know what that's like. So hopefully I can relate to everything. Uh, so let me uh, begin by saying um, I want to talk essentially about uh, how the water gets in, and I will focus primarily on water. However, of course, wind and other uh, hazards uh, do play in uh, a hurricane or extreme weather event. I want to also mention uh, hazards. There are many hazards and how to control these hazards, and some of them are rather dangerous, like uh, lead paint and maybe asbestos. Uh, but clearly, the biggest question tends to be around mold. And with mold, what is it? What's the way to reduce it uh, and living with it? So I'll, I'll clearly do that. Uh, how to set up some preventative measures so you're not significantly affected. I think you all know with climate change, there's speculation that there will be more events and they will be more extreme. So it's all about preparedness. Uh, and of course, not just protecting your home, but also protecting yourself. And of course, practical guidance. That's uh, most of you, those of you that know me, I'm a practical guy. I believe in real uh, down to earth sort of solutions. So let's get started with this. Uh, so how does the water get in? Well, of course it depends on the type of housing, but let's say it's a typical single family house and you are near the groundwater, like in this picture here. Well, clearly as rain and events and different seasons come in, that groundwater goes up and down. So think of your, your, your basement as sort of a swimming pool, but keeping the water out instead of preventing it from, uh, uh, keeping the water from coming in versus the water going out. So that barrier needs to be quite tight. And of course, during these events, one of the first thing that happens, whether it's coming water coming from gutters or water coming from uh, runoff or down the hill into your homes. Uh, my neighbor inadvertently left the basement doors open during the last weather extreme event, what's called the Bilko doors, and uh, got flooded that way. But the key there is to prevent this water from accumulating. If you can't prevent it from uh, coming in, let's make sure we get it out faster than it's coming in. And when you look at foundations, there's all sorts of types. Uh, you have a concrete foundation, which is pretty tight, especially with modern day waterproofing. Uh, however, the cinder block foundation isn't quite as tight and subject to cracks. So as you peruse that picture on the right, you'll see there's all sorts of ways of the water getting in. And what you could sort of admit to yourself is it's going to come in. How do I get it out? And what's the best way to get it out? Uh, and of course, that's the, the focus of, this, of the, the seminar. Um, many of you do have sump pumps and we'll talk about the practicality of that and what can go right or wrong with sump pumps on that. This is a video, let me play this. I, I took out the sound, but this was sent to me just the other day from a, a friend of mine in, oh, you can hear the sound. But you could see the bubbling water coming in, rushing in through cracked foundation. And this happens to be a slight break in a cinder block foundation that the water is uh, rushing in. And it could be on one side of the house or it could be around the entire house. But clearly it would have been nice to catch this before the event occurred. And when you looked at what happened to the house, this is uh, in the same basement in the house. Uh, the neighborhood is, um, um, I believe, Montclair. Uh, we see what we, what we never want to see. We don't want to see a brand new finished basement with six inches of water, and in this case, muddy water, uh, which is indicative really of a, 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 the, the river sort of coming in. When the water is clear, it generally means the groundwater has come up into the space, as opposed to uh, what you're seeing now, which is surface water, which has gotten muddy through the soil, rushing in through a crack. So this immediately sort of gives a hint as to where it's coming. But you see what's happening. You see that the water is touching the mattresses, the couches, 
all the surface small areas. And this is the water rushing in. The next slide, you'll see it stopped flowing in. It's very quiet now. And in a matter of a few hours, this went from flooding to essentially this. Uh, and that's good news. As a matter of fact, if you look carefully, you really can't even see too much staining on the walls of the sheetrock. And that's probably because these walls were painted with a, a tighter sort of semi-gloss paint, which adds as a moisture barrier also. So now the key is what can be salvaged? And that's, uh, that's the key for the presentation. And we'll talk more about this. Also, will mold grow? And how do I control it? And are toxins in there? And, and how do I clean this material? So, uh, and of course, the key there is prevention. Should, should I have had this type of furniture in the basement uh, if it was all susceptible? So let's go over uh, what industrial hygienists love is hazard assessment. And after we assess the hazard, we evaluate it and we sort of control it. And what are the hazards? Well, uh, hygienists uh, like myself usually put them in categories. So when you look at a picture like this, this is Hurricane Sandy in the Rockaways, uh, it, it's a disaster. It's, 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 it looks like a war zone, my gosh. There's so much going on here. And sometimes you may not appreciate that there is chemicals and biological material and there's some maybe physical hazards and safety hazards. Just walking around this area is, is a tripping hazard and you have electrical. So, so the key is to make sure you're, of course, protecting yourself as well as protecting uh, anybody who's working for you or with you on, on this. Uh, with regards to chemicals, some of the things you may not appreciate is that uh, common chemicals such as cleaning, Clorox, uh, oils, greases, antifreeze. Think of what's in your garage. Think of what's under your sink and ask yourself, what if this stuff was released and, of course, is now floating in a basement or somewhere else. Um, so there is concern here that should it even be on the floor and should things be elevated? And we'll talk later on about a, one preventative measure is to sort of predict a flood and say, well, how can I prevent it? And of course, raising this to a different level or making sure bottles are tightly sealed so that any chemical in this uh, under the sink cannot be released. Uh, and you, you may not appreciate that what is under your sink can be everything from a simple oil, olive oil, uh, WD-40, or it can be rather nasty um, uh, dishwasher chemicals. Dishwasher uses very powerful soaps, and if those soaps are mobilized in a flood, uh, it can cause some serious uh, corrosion and irritability problems. So uh, there's a reason why they're packed in those tiny plastic bags. You don't want human hands touching that. But of course, what we're really concerned about is ultimately biological hazards. Um, uh, I think the first thing you appreciate is that the sewage, the sewage system, the sewer, uh, the septic tank, the uh, sewage treatment plant overflowed as happened in many communities, uh, and then now you have raw sewage floating about in the community. Uh, so let's talk about biological hazards, and they come from both surface uh, soil as well as um, contaminants thereof. So this picture of Bound Brook just a couple of weeks ago, uh, I've been to Bound Brook. Uh, it's a lovely little town, but one wonders, should it even be there, right? Because anybody, everybody in New Jersey knows that this town continuously is, is struggling with uh, the overflow of the Raritan River. And even the stadium uh, in Bridgewater got seriously flooded. So, so of course, the design of these communities should be, should have some uh, foresight in thinking what happens when a plant, a sewage treatment plant overflows. Has someone answered the question, should it really be a grade level? Maybe it should be elevated so that it can sustain a 10 foot flood. Uh, however, these are old communities. So retrofitting some of these uh, plants will be very, very difficult. Um, fortunately, let me say water pollution in America has been tremendously uh, well um, dealt with. Uh, we are, Our waters are cleaner than ever. People are swimming in New York Harbor, around Manhattan. They're swimming in Raritan Bay and even down uh, 
uh, these rivers. So the water itself is clean, but keep in mind that during a flood, it mobilizes everything else. So don't necessarily be afraid of the water, except what it's really carrying. Uh, of course, when it comes to cleaning some of this uh, area, we sort of uh, break things down into porous and non-porous. So the bathroom on the right, and no, that is not my bathroom. Uh, the bathroom on the right is wonderful because it's hard, impermeable, uh, ceramic, porcelain materials. All you need after the flood is really a good cleaning with soap and water, drying it out, and maybe a post-cleaning disinfection with alcohol. We, we now all have abundant amounts of alcohol uh, gel with us and or Clorox uh, to sort of get that final disinfecting coating. So this is, there's a reason why bathrooms are made like this and we don't have carpets in bathrooms and we prefer not to have sheetrock in bathrooms. You know, everything should be tiled. When you go to an industrial bathroom, you'll see everything is tiled because it's hosed down. So bathrooms are accustomed to sort of getting wet. Kitchens have a lot more permeable materials, uh, whether the cabinets are solid wood or uh, formica of some sort or press board. They will accept uh, and absorb water and then so causing two possible things. One is the material will be damaged. Number two, mold may grow. So these types of settings are also very challenging. But I think most of you notice that kitchens do not have carpets. Uh, it's not a good idea to have a porous floor in a kitchen, not because of food falling, but also because of flooding and wetting and sink spilling. So it is a wet, sort of a, a semi-wet environment. <clears throat> and of course, basements and furnishings like this, living rooms are usually the most problematic areas. Uh, it's very hard, essentially impossible to kill bacteria and mold and viruses on some of this porous material thoroughly. And I think most of you know what you'll end up doing with that. You see a little note to myself, salt water versus fresh water. Well, interestingly enough, uh, fresh water is, is, is good. It doesn't corrode. It salvages uh, wet uh, fixtures. So if a home is flooded, let's say in Rockaway, where it's salt water during Hurricane Sandy, it's a very different sort of remediation than it would be in something like Bowenbrook, where it's just surface water. Um, and needless to say, salt is corrosive to electrical, so the entire electrical system may have to be rebuilt because of that, whereas fresh water, it's uh, much simpler that, that way. Here's an interesting fact. Mold doesn't prefer salt water. Uh, of course, fresh water is where moles uh, thrive or a certain amount of fresh water in, uh, moisture. But uh, we noticed in Hurricane Sandy, some of the homes did not have that rampant uh, mold growth because of uh, two things. One is temperature, it was chilly. And number two, it was salt water and not very uh, um, desirable for many moles. Uh, heading on to moles, um, they clearly are, are, are scariest things. Uh, the, you could see it, right? You could see the fuzziness of mold. Viruses, of course, now with COVID, we're all virologists and viral experts, so we know how they're transmitted. But a lot of viruses will deposit on surfaces and touching areas, whether it's a virus or a bacteria like cholera. Uh, it, there's been so many you know, epidemics of cholera post-flooding in in uh, low and middle income countries, uh, but that's, um, uh, that's an ingestion source. So what you're looking at here is mold growth that occurs many days afterwards. I need to spend some time on mold and um, Mitch Rosen and I have done so many mold seminars for you know, many, many health departments in New Jersey. And we're happy with some of the work we've done and assistance we give. But I wanna remind you all that this is a perfectly natural, uh, normal flora. It's all over your body. It's all over your hair. It's, it's throughout the um, uh, environment. You cannot have a mold-free house. Let me repeat. You can never make your house mold-free. It's impossible. Uh, just opening the windows and you'll get the spores. And whether it's bread mold, penicillin on the left, 
or that black powdery stuff you see in onions. Yes, that's mold, mold spores. Uh, however, what you do is of course just rinse it and you're fine. Even, even eat, touching that to your mouth will, will not cause anything uh, serious. Um, so keep in, keep in mind that mold is natural and our bodies have become accustomed to it. However, there are limits to that statement and we'll talk about that in a second. So what makes mold grow? And this is so important when you're remediating or understanding a response during a flooding event or extreme weather event. It is of course, water is number one. Uh, it also needs food. It also needs the right temperature. So what is controlling the planet from being uh, overgrown with mold? It's essentially moisture. Uh, in a forest, what does most of the uh, decaying? It's mold and fungi and, uh, and uh, uh, mold, fungi and yeast are, with, are sort of decaying everything, not bacteria. Your apple doesn't decay in the forest because of bacteria, it's fungi and mold that attack it. So moisture, it's all about moisture and it's really the one variable that we can sort of control. Uh, so keep in mind, I've said it, several times now, and I'll say it again, it's all about how much moisture is in your carpet, in your sweater, uh, in your clothing, in your socks, or in, your, in the ground. Uh, there's plenty of food for mold to grow. Uh, the food is basically a carbon source, and that could be a sugar, it could be wood, it could be skin cells, it could be mites, it could be ticks. Uh, trust me, there's plenty of carbon floating about for mold to sort of latch on to and eat. So you give it heat, you give it a little water and it starts eating. And what it's doing here is eating the agar in and the nutrients and the sugars in this plate. Uh, you're looking at a culture plate that we use to enumerate mold. And each of those different uh, specks is a mold colony. So you see at least what, one, two, three, probably seven different moles there. Uh, at about um, nine o'clock, you'll see a mucoid one, which is actually yeast. And the pink ones are also yeast. Uh, the rest are, well, you have to have it tested. But this is not what you're gonna see on your, on your couch. What you're gonna see may not even look like mold. It may look like this. And this, these are mold colonies growing on wood where you may quickly pass it off as, oh, that's, uh, that's just dirt, that's just residue from the flood as it settles. But what I'm getting to is that mold will look differently when it grows on different, what we call substrates or different materials. Um, and now uh, let me do a little test here for you. I want you to think about why is mold not growing on this brand new plastic shower curtain, even though it's wet? And I think you, when you look at that Venn diagram of those three circles, you'll realize that uh, it's wet, the temperature is good, but there's no food. There's no food on a brand new shower curtain. After a couple of months of using it, our body cells and soaps um, adhere to it and the mold has something to eat and you'll see the staining on shower curtains. So why is uh, tomato sauce in the refrigerator not growing any mold? Well, I think you figured it out, right? It's cold. It's, it's plenty of moisture, plenty of uh, food, carbon, tomatoes, good food, but it's too cold. Uh, and lastly, why are crackers on a table not infested with mold? You could leave them out for a, a year and they'll never grow mold. Well, there's just not enough moisture. Temperature is great. Uh, carbon source is great. So the key there is when all those three are at the right ratio, the mold colonies will grow. And you may say, well, how do I know if it's, if it's mold? Uh, and the answer is do not hire a specialist to come in and tell you. Most of the time, you, can, you know it. You uh, use your organs to uh, analyze it. You look at it. You see this fuzzy uh, three-dimensional uh, material on a surface. You could even touch it and realize it's sort of power, power, uh, powderly, very um, uh, like a fine uh, residue. Some people aren't sure if that black speck on the ceiling is mold. Well, if you touch it and nothing comes off it, 
It probably isn't. It's probably just a staining from some drip. But of course, if you could smell it, and when I remember in, uh, in my travels in Hurricane Sandy, we would go into a basement and I would sort of hold my breath. And then the minute I'm in the basement, inhale. Uh, this way I get the full aroma of the basement. And if I could smell a mustiness, I know that one, there's mold there and it's actively growing. If you could smell mustiness or mold, earthy smell, that not only means there's mold there, but it's actively growing as opposed to dead mold, which is dried out and you can't smell it. Um, but keep in mind, if it's dried out and you can't smell it and powdery, add a little water and it'll come back to life and reproduce again and again. So please don't, you don't need someone to tell you you have a mold problem. Matter of fact, you will have a mold problem ultimately if you don't act. So. I'm gonna let you look at these pictures, which is a, a horrible story. <coughs> this is on the Jersey shore. Uh, if you're wondering what you're looking at, yes, all those dots, that polka dot, the bottom right, all that staining is the mold cultures that have taken over the house. Um, a lot of lessons in this picture. First of all, let me give you the story. Uh, this was, um, a flooding event caused by a hot water uh, tank uh, exploding, it's not exploding, but basically the hose rupturing. The homeowner went home after a weekend in the fall. Uh, this happened in about October, well, right now, October, November, uh, did not shut the water down and the hose broke. Uh, so you had hot water accumulating in the basement, which produced practically steam because the windows were closed. And I don't know if you remember um, the movie Jumanji, Jumanji, the original one, where it's like a jungle. So basically you had great conditions, hot, moist air, the surfaces were moist, great temperature, plenty of food and time. So finally, the neighbor called up the homeowner and said, hey, buddy, uh, you better get out of here. Something's going on with your house. I see condensation inside the windows, not outside, inside. So something's going on. Of course, the homeowner went there, and this is what they saw. Uh, I just want to tell you that this takes weeks to get to this point. This cannot happen overnight. Uh, yes the growth can start, but for something this pervasive, it really takes a long time. For one thing I want you to focus on is um, flat paint is porous, and you'll notice the green and the white and the blue, there's a lot of mold growth because the moisture penetrates and of course brings it to the right moisture content. And then you have uh, spores germinating. All those dots were there. There were single mold spores that grew from one to two to four to eight, on and on. And all of a sudden it's a big colony. So every single one of those dots was one mold spore. And now you see it's taken over. So when I say there's mold everywhere, this is proof. No one came here and contaminated the basement or the house with mold. Uh, notice there's no growth on painted materials like the door jams and the pipes and the bed frame, uh, you know, you need, you need roots. The, the mold, uh, count, the mold um, organism has uh, uh, roots and it has antenna. It has an aerial part to it and it has a root system. And the roots can't really dig into painted surfaces. It's just too hard. So the porous surfaces. So you may say, well, why is it not growing on the, uh, the blankets and the towels? That's a good question. And uh, I don't really know the answer to that, but I suspect it's synthetic. It's not, if, if it was a pure cotton material, it would have been growing on there. Or it could have a nice plastic film on it, more secure. So it depends on the material. But the fact that the comforter is not covered in mold spores probably means that is, uh, it's a synthetic com comforter. Okay, uh, look, you could just watch this and cry, uh, uh, but it is amazing how the door has nothing growing because of the, the lack of porosity, but the inside of the closet 
it's it's a regular jungle of mold spores. Anyway, to uh, answer your question, the house was completely demolished. It was an insurance issue. They the homeowner was covered for water damage when it comes from in the inside, which is often the case. So this house was literally destroyed and rebuilt on the Jersey Shore. Uh, so you can only imagine what it's like. Uh, uh, the price of this. Okay. Anyway, before I, this is not a lesson on on health, uh, but I want to tell you that um, that mold, by and large, is not toxic. There's no real dose response, meaning the mold spores, the more headaches, the more irritability, the more uh, uh, respiratory problems. However, uh, for people who have allergies or are asthmatic. Mold has been known to one, uh, exacerbate the asthma, uh, trigger the asthma, and possibly even cause asthma. So what I'm saying is if you're at all suffering from an allergic disease or asthmatic or some, uh, something of that nature, please consult your physician. You probably should not be cleaning up that moldy carpet that, that grew out of control from the basement. Just get someone else to do it. But we saw many people, healthy, what apparently young, healthy individuals having problems in Hurricane Sandy because they were they had some type of allergy and reacted poorly. And then other people are perfectly fine. So it really is all over the gamut on that. OK, as far as physical issues of heat, noise, and radiation, uh, we don't see much of that. Remember, chemical, biological, physical. Uh, but we do see a lot of safety hazards. So when you look at pictures like this, uh, this is a on the left, you see a, uh, a power source, a, a portable gas generator. Uh, this is a great idea. Um, you know, I'd like to have one myself, uh, but I live in an apartment in New York City and they won't let me. Uh, but the reality here is that it's releasing carbon monoxide. So you don't want to be putting this inside a basement to power the dehumidifier, right? So you want to make sure you're uh, using it in a well-ventilated space. And I'm not even sure this is a well-ventilated space because this is running sort of unfiltered for a long time. And then the picture on the right, oh my gosh, one, two, three, four air conditioners, one hot water heater, a washer dryer, all destroyed because of uh, flooding. Uh, I'm not sure uh, how the air conditioners got damaged. It depends whether we're downstairs or not. But, but what I'm saying is there's a lot of safety hazards just moving this furniture and slipping and, and falling and ladders. So make sure you're protected against that and you, and you don't have to be the one uh, demolishing or cleaning up this mess. Um, and later on, we'll talk about volunteers. And sometimes they're paid, they're paid employees that come over and clean up things. And this is a worker who uh, is part of a company. And of course, uh, the suit is, what can I say? There's so many wrong things here. The mask is being, the respirator, the N95 is being worn the wrong way. I don't know why he's got hearing protection, why his suit is not fully zippered up, but uh, at least uh, someone made a, a, an attempt at personal protective equipment. Uh, but we will talk about what could be in that debris in a, shortly. So let's talk about response. Uh, in, in a lot of what we do, whether it's uh, volunteers responding, professional companies responding, or you and a couple of friends helping to clean out that basement, these are the steps. We call it muck out, gut clean, and, and testing. Let's begin with a muck out. A muck out is essentially removing everything that got wet and you believe is unsalvageable. And trust me, a completely wet carpet uh, and completely wet couch will likely be unsalvageable. It's not, not always the case if you act quickly, it may be. But I'm not sure you want a couch that was sitting in possibly water contaminated with sewage, right? So there's also that concern. Uh, but muck out is fun. You're ripping things apart and you're moving it out. You don't have to be terribly clean. Uh, I, I would say volunteers like doing muck out. They also very much like doing a gut. A gut means getting the hammer, smashing, and who doesn't like uh, smashing walls down and ripping things apart? 
Uh, so gut and uh, muck out tend to happen quickly in these sites. Uh, what does not happen very often is, um, is well, uh, is cleaning. Uh, and I'll get to that. Keep in mind that when you're doing all this, you're all now uh, personal protective equipment specialists. After a year of COVID, you know about gloves, you know about hand hygiene, you know, you know the difference between a face mask and a respirator and a surgical mask, on and on and on. But keep in mind that respiratory protection is, is, should be elevated in any of this work. That uh, even though you may not be allergic to mold or have any type of respiratory condition, you should be protecting yourself if you're going into a basement that has couches that had tremendous amounts of mold spores on it. So make sure you're wearing the right shoes uh, and you have the right gloves, whether they're construction gloves or chemicals, give some thought into that. Uh, and keep in mind to protect your clothing so you don't want to go home. After Hurricane Sandy, in uh, New Jersey, of course, there's, uh, there's more people are driving automobiles in New Jersey. But in Hurricane Sandy, the volunteers were coming on the subway and going home on the subway. And after, and this is what they look like, uh, the fellow on the bottom left. So, um, so do please be careful. The supplies for cleaning are nothing out of the ordinary. Good soaps, towels, scrub brushes, disposable materials. There's nothing super special, including the bleach and, and uh, some of those materials we'll talk about in a second. However, your best friend here, and if there's one word I'm gonna repeat now a million times will be dehumidification. What you really want is to empty the, uh, the site of all the water, drain it, get it out somehow. We'll talk about that <coughs> in a little while. Uh, however, what you really want to do is dehumidify. And what this means is a machine that sucks in air and using the equivalent of, of an air conditioning uh, compressor system uh, withdraws that moisture from the air so dry air comes out. Moist air comes in, dry air comes out. The thing you're looking at on the left, that black box, is a pump that is made to pump up the water and get it out of the basement. Um, you don't want to necessarily uh, put it in a bucket because these dehumidifiers following a, a flood, uh, they can be working 24-7 for five days. So that means you'll have to be emptying it every few hours, depending on how big of a machine you get. Uh, the one on the left is a couple of hundred bucks from a uh, home supplier. The one on the right is uh, over $3,000 and really is an industrial machine. It depends on the size of the space, uh, but this is critical. And the more, the better. Uh, there's also people always ask me, should I keep the windows open or close? And um, it's, it's a good question. Depends, of course, on temperature, if you can keep it open. But you want to get ventilation into the basement. The more ventilation, whether you're pumping air in or out, preferably out, uh, the more moisture is going to leave and the machines will sort of work uh, better. So essentially we want to dehumidify that space. But here's the important lesson. Uh, you have between 24 and 48 hours to get that carpet essentially bone dry before mold spores will hatch, germinate and start producing colonies. And then within a few days, the colonies will get to a point where you'll be able to smell it. So you'll get that mustiness. So what drives me crazy, and please don't do this, is the insurance company says, don't do anything until we get there. Well, three days later, when they show up, it's too late. All your materials are destroyed. Um, so take lots of pictures, but it is this big problem that we have where insurance companies don't want you to intervene until they come there and assess the damage. Unless you're convinced that the basement's a total, uh, total um, gut job. So again, mold spores will germinate at the right moisture level within 24, 48 hours. One makes two, makes four, and before you know it, the logarithmic growth is up and the colonies will start to appear on surfaces as little dots and they get bigger and bigger. So, um, so you have to get moisture out. Uh, if you don't have 
uh, a dehumidifier, go buy one. They're affordable and they're very usable, uh, useful for a variety of things. But in addition, box fans or window fans to get air out is valuable. But the, the great thing is now they have these small blowers and they're actually, the one you see here is just, you know, uh, not even a $150, but it's a high speed blower that's made to almost go under the carpet. So you're drying the, uh, the carpet from the top using dehumidifier and fans. And now you're drying it from the bottom. So if you really wanna keep the carpet, but I'd say you should dry it anyway, but if you really wanna keep it, you have to get air blowing underneath it. And that's what the picture on the right is all about. Uh, they're very useful things, and they're pretty uh, useful uh, just to get air through a house. But I, I don't see a practical use for this. Uh, box fans come in really uh, many, many types of uh, designs, and they're very useful. But the carpet fans you see on the right are pretty limited. Um, you may have a shop vac and say, well, gee, I'll just vacuum out the water. Good luck. Um, essentially, um, uh, the moisture and we'll get to this in a few uh, minutes, is if it's very wet, the mold cannot grow. If it's very dry, or let's say just dry, mold cannot grow. So there's a certain range. So what's really interesting is you could have a carpet that's underwater for days and nothing will grow. But the minute the water disappears and the moisture in the carpet goes from 100% to 50% to 40% to 20%, now at, at a certain range, spores will wake up, grow, and take over. Uh, so I like the idea of, of getting initial moisture out using a, a wet vac or a carpet. Uh, however, it is not in lieu of dehumidification. You have to get that you have to get that carpet down to below 10% moisture. Um, and then of course, people have HEPA vacs, which you see on the right is a, is a typical vacuum cleaner. It's got a cyclone uh, uh, collection bag to speed things up, but it has a terminal filter, which ca captures very fine particles. Uh, you don't need this uh, for mold control. And it's only maybe maybe months later when the moisture is gone and the carpet's back to normal, then you may want to try to get those fine, fine particles out. But um, be careful using HEPA vacs in wet environments because the matrix of the vac, vacuum uh, filter, the bag itself, the high efficiency particulate air filter is subject to water damage. It actually is like tissue it will actually fall apart on you and those are expensive to replace. Now, this picture, and I got it off the web, I said, well, this, is, this has got a lot of lessons here. I like the idea that plywood is sealing the window and, and air is blowing out. You use plastic. So they're getting a lot of ventilation in here. Of course, air going out has to come from someplace. So I'm not quite sure exactly where it's coming from. I don't believe you need to spray anything. Um, Adding more moisture to the carpet uh, will make it heavier and it doesn't really do much. I don't know what's in the sprayer. Maybe uh, she feels a little chlorine in there would be an extra killing it. But why are you killing it? You're rolling it up and throwing it out. Um, and of course, wrapping it in plastic is a very good idea. But this does remind us that the pad sometimes is a bigger problem than the carpet. So that usually it's a two-step process. And underneath, the subflooring can be a bigger problem. Anyway, um, I need to speed up a little. I just wanted to remind you that cleaning hard surfaces is rather easy. Uh, there are some steps there. Uh, nothing. Please do not clean it with bleach or alcohol initially. Just soap and water, wipe it down. And then at the end, you may want to uh, put something more. Cleaning wood is more complicated. You may actually have to scrub something. Those uh, green dots on that white painted staircase is uh, those are mold colonies. So you could literally wipe that off and maybe lightly scrub it and dry it and at some point paint it. Uh, sometimes you have to take off, uh, you know, two, three feet of uh, sheetrock to get to the material and throw that out. Sheetrock is made of gypsum, which does not grow mold. Plaster does not grow mold by and large. 
Uh, however, it's the paper that does it. And what better paper is the underside non-painted part of the sheetrock. Once you paint it, you sort of have a protective coating. So what you're looking at there on the left is a water line and you could see how the mold sort of stopped growing right around here. The mold stopped growing because the moisture level fell off. And um, uh, the good news is that something like uh, fiberglass does not grow mold, so that's great. Uh, however, the wood, of course, would. So now if you have crawl spaces, um, you'll never be able to get these totally dry. Crawl spaces almost by definition are, are moist. Uh, 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 however, if they're concrete, many of them you can sort of do your best to mop it out or soak it up or, or put in a French drain or put in a, um, uh, a, a sump pump of some sort. But if it's dirt, it, there's no way to get this totally dry. One concern here is that the moisture will migrate up. So I have seen people put dehumidifiers in crawl spaces to lower that moisture content uh, or just pumping air, uh, especially this time of year where the air is very dry and winter it's even drier. Fortunately, Hurricane Sandy happened in late October. So it was a pretty dry season. So pumping cold air through a basement actually helped to dry it there. Exterior siding. Uh, can be very complicated uh, depending on what's it made of. So I think in this case, you know, you need to get some professional help uh, on that. Subflooring is always a problem because of uh, the different types of, there's so many different types of subflooring. Old fashioned plywood flooring is very, very, very good uh, and sort of dense, but some of the new stuff is a fiberboard, a little less dense and more amenable to mold growth. And the picture on the bottom right, you see how it's actually mold growing from the other side. Now that mold didn't come from the top and penetrate, no. It actually was moisture in the basement, depositing on the, soaking up the wood and then triggering a mold growth. And again, the spores have always been there. They're just waiting to grow. They're just waiting for time and they can wait. Uh, we spoke about dehumidifiers, but I just wanna, Refresh uh, your memory here that they should be big. Um, they should be the right size. Uh, if possible, get a few of them. Uh, and it's the first thing that sells out after a flood is dehumidifiers. Uh, you want to, if possible, elevate them. Uh, I have here, keep the windows closed. It depends on the setting, but essentially you want to dry all the air in. And if opening the windows just brings more moist air in, well, we don't want to do that. So very often just shutting the windows and drying that interior space uh, would be good. Uh, what speed? Full speed, dry setting, 24 seven running. Just keep this thing going until it's sort of dried up. Uh, if you don't have a dehumidifier, heaters work, but just heating a basement with moisture will just produce a steam room. So you wanna get box fans to ventilate that air out. So again, dehumidifier, a couple of box fans, and you have success. Uh, and again, you don't have much time. So the minute the water is out of the basement, whether it's a couch or whether it's a carpet or whether it's toys, you really want to get that dry as fast as you can. And I think in this case, this, it's salvageable. I mean, look at the flooring, doesn't look too bad. The molding just needs a good cleaning. And uh, I would, of course, uh, you just got to keep getting that moisture out. And fortunately, the synthetics that we use in chairs and, and uh, flooring these days doesn't absorb water. It's not like wood. And in some ways, that's good because it doesn't sort of bubble and break off. Uh, but ultimately, gang, when you're designing a, a finished basement, when you're asking what to do, think flooding. Um, I know it's a horrible way, but it's, it's, of course, emergency preparedness. Should I be putting this in the basement? And if I am, is it disposable? Uh, for example, you may say, well, look, this is a $200 couch. Uh, if it gets wet and ruined, I'm good with that. Out it goes. But you don't want to be putting a $3,000 couch in a basement uh, where it sits right on top of the floor, not legs so that if it's, it gets destroyed, you'll be crying. So think very carefully about this. Um, uh, and this person decided this was sort of disposable furniture. Uh, so, but again, this is having some, uh, some 
thought into what am I going to use this? Also, I have a, a note to myself here, vinyl versus fabric. So if this was a vinyl couch or a leather couch, it's a little bit more easy to clean, especially vinyl. Leather, of course, is food for, for mold, so be careful with that. And then, of course, finishing the job. Um, and what we want here is when everything's clean and the, the bacteria and the dirt is off the walls, uh, you want to thoroughly clean out, uh, dry out the building. Now, this is a problem, and um, I've seen this twice, where in sort of well-meaning people, happen to be firefighters in a community, couldn't wait to fix grandma's house, which is totally destroyed, and they volunteered to go in there, donate materials, and right after the water settled, they rebuilt the house. And what they did is essentially put sheetrock over wet construction materials, and the mold came back. They did no one any favors. So you need to, it will take weeks for a home to thoroughly dry out. And many people said after Hurricane Sandy, don't even think about rebuilding until the spring. I mean, six months. Uh, and I would say at least three months. So please, I know you can't wait to get back to normal following a flood, it, it's very painful, but you just have to let uh, get that moisture out. And by the way, moisture meters are fairly inexpensive these days, so you may want to invest in uh, a few. Uh, this uh, essentially, uh, these moisture meters, when the number is below uh, 10, thereabouts, 10%, uh, uh, it means there's not enough moisture for mold to grow. So we use this, <clears throat> we use this very often to answer the question, are you ready to rebuild? <clears throat> these are moisture meters available at a lot of stores. And even this, this is uh, six weeks after Hurricane Sandy. That, and you can see the water line there. The electrical box needs to be, of course, uh, replaced because it was salt water. But I tested the wood, and it's still at 19% moisture content weeks and weeks after. And of course, there was no dehumidification. So uh, I just want to end by saying, please be careful. If you're not sure if your house has lead paint or asbestos, be very careful. Some of this lead uh, painted material causes debris that can contaminate. If you have pipes that look like air cell insulation or have a white covering on it, it's an old home, get someone in professionally to answer the question. Essentially, leave it alone. Uh, asbestos doesn't grow on, on, I'm sorry, mold doesn't grow on pipes and um, on asbestos. And this is just a picture of the many different layers that a house may have. In addition to having lead paint, this has several layers of asbestos uh, sheeting on that. And, um, and I'm sad that this person threw out this frame because of a little mold growth on the paint. Uh, it's not an original, I know, but it, it could have probably been sal salvaged. But the, the, the motivation is I, I want to get this out. It's gross. Get it out of here. It smells. I can't. Uh, so I understand that. But not everything is, um, is, should be destroyed just because it got wet. After all, it's only water in many ways. So it can be uh, very often cleaned up. What's interesting about this is that the mold grew on canvas. And that despite the paint, the mold still was able to dig in those cracks. OK, I think I may want to just end here. Uh, maybe I'll just talk about there's all sorts of volunteers. Um, yeah, Mormon Helping Hands, AmeriCare. So these people tend to be structured. They know what they're doing. They're prepared. They have a, a team. Then you have this loosely structured people, church groups saying, hey, let's meet on Sunday morning and help these people. Uh, very often, they're not sure exactly what to do. Maybe one or two people are, have experience here. And then, of course, um, agencies are sort of well uh, offered, but then you have private citizens that very often just rush to help people. And there's so much to do in this particular slide. Uh, and, and very often they just need guidance. So uh, during any disaster, whether it's Bound Brook or Hurricane Sandy or Hurricane Floyd or what's to come in the future, um, you know, they, they, these volunteers need to also be protected. And Right now, volunteers fall in the cracks of occupational safety and health regulations. So I think I'm going to end here. And uh, thank you for your time. I want to take a couple of questions. 
So yes. That's great. Jack, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, oh. We do have a number of questions. I'm sure we won't get to all of them. Um, what are your thoughts about the use of UV lamps to help prevent mold or kill mold? Okay, UV lamps have been used for a long time in hospitals and restaurants. They're a, a registered restricted device. So the, the lamp has to be very strong for it to work. It is um, uh, released at night under high intensity in a hospital room or in a, in a kitchen. And it works very good to kill viruses, mold and spores, uh, essentially viruses and bacteria on surfaces. Uh, it depends where that light hits. Uh, the UV lights that you get on eBay or Amazon probably aren't strong enough to do much. Uh, but depending on how close they are to the surface, they can, can be useful. But if you wanted to get a UV light to disinfect, surface disinfect the basement, you would need a very powerful one that probably is outside your um, uh, control. They just won't sell it to you because you're not a licensed uh, hospital. Okay, thank you. Um, do you have a recommended level of humidity for homes or inside buildings to help prevent mold growth? Yes, there's plenty published on this and Google it, look for authoritative sor sor sources for this, but generally uh, uh, under 10%, 10 to 15, 12%. Anything under 10%, 12%, and it's a gradient. But above, beyond a certain amount, there's just too much water, too much water for mold to grow, right? Mold doesn't grow in, in drinking water, right? It's just too wet. Um, so uh, there's a range there. But that's, there's a lot of good stuff on the web on that. Thank you. Um, you mentioned a few times about paints and certain types of paints maybe helping to prevent mold grown so are there some that are less porous and if so do you have any that you recommend yes i there's a reason why window sills are painted in high gloss because rain comes in wets it all the time high gloss is also sometimes called enamel a very hard outside coating so i would use in bathrooms use uh if possible semi-gloss or, or a uh, eggshell finish at least. You don't want to use flat wall paint on, in a bathroom. The water will actually just absorb into that. And especially ceilings. Ceilings are almost always painted with a uh, more, a tighter uh, coat, semi-gloss of some sort. The problem with semi-gloss in a bathroom, you'll see all the cracks in your walls. So uh, if it's a perfectly brand new bathroom, it's okay, but if it's not, you, all the little ripples will be more visible, but semi-gloss. So a follow-up to that then, Jack, would you suggest that's what's used in a basement? Yes, uh, absolutely. Depending on the basement uh, structure, whether it's cinder block, uh, I have this dilemma right now. We're dealing with uh, fixing a friend's basement. It's a brand new house. And now uh, we we went to the store and we got very expensive waterproof coating. It's a paint, it's an enamel paint, sort of glossy. That's also waterproofing. It's almost, you have to roll it on, it's so thick, but it dries and produces practically a plastic barrier over those basements. So I would definitely uh, paint a new basement or even an old basement with a very good waterproofing paint. Uh, and it could get pricey. I think this was $300 for a five gallon pail but it's worth the insurance. Got it, thank you. Um, how can we get rid of mold in our bathrooms since water and heat make the mold grow? Yes, they are constantly, um, it's, a, it's a constant challenge. Uh, ventilation, uh, leave the fan on, open a window. Of course, ideally when you're showering, keep a window open and get, it, get the moisture out of there. But people like hot, you know, steamy bathrooms and I get it. Uh, so the key is to get the water out as fast as you can. Um, most of the mold that's accumulating is in the cracks on the bottom. Uh, the silicone is very good today and silicone doesn't grow mold. But as you wash and the soap and the hairs from your body and the cells fall in those cracks, that's enough food for mold to start growing and it produces that black line that you see. It's not dangerous. 
uh, but the key is to sort of you know dry it. If you could somehow dry that, and I'm sort of a little obsessive that way after a shower, I'm one of those nuts that actually squeegees the glass and the walls, and then I wipe everything down with a rag and uh, I leave the door open. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's constant challenge. And you have no mold in your bathroom, I'm sure, because of that. <laughs> yes. Thank right. Um, I'll do one last question here. If a homeowner has small mold buildup, um, can they clean this themselves, or do they need to hire a professional to remove it? Yes, and there's a lot of good guidelines, especially the New York City Department of Health has some really good publications on this. To answer the question bluntly, do it yourself. Um, it's not dangerous. And now that you're professionals with wearing PPE and masks, you know, put on your N95, uh, use gloves, water. It's essentially, you need to scrape it off, get down to the clean corners, let it dry thoroughly a couple of days, and then recaulk it with nice fresh grout. Um, and then periodically with an old toothbrush, scrub the corners as you see the mold going. The black staining you see in grout is not necessarily the mold, it's their waste products. So when they, when they live, they excrete and much of that black material is not active mold, it's just their staining, their waste products, uh, which is not dangerous, but it is unsightly. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And, and we do have several questions that are broader conversations about um, climate change and things that we can't really address at the moment, but we will have uh, webinars on those topics. Um, one last question is, can you address black mold and health problems? Oh, uh, potentially? Thank, you. thank you so much for bringing that up. That's a great question. Uh, ignore it. Uh, black mold, Stachybotrys uh, chitarum, is a unique mold. It's, it's out there. And it has particular toxicity beyond most moles. Uh, but it is impossible to really differentiate between stacky and other uh, moles. Many of them are, are similar colors. So just because it's black mold and it's a toxic mold doesn't mean you should do anything special. All mold in a bathroom, in a ceiling, needs to be cleaned and uh, remediated, just painted over. Uh, don't treat stacky or, or this black stuff any differently. Uh, that's what the health departments are, are urging. Um, and keep in mind that the microbial waste products from black mold, they are irritating, but not universally to everybody. So um, it's we, we, we try to dispel this rumor that black mold is sort of this monster that's really, really bad, uh, that's, that needs special attention. All mold needs to be cleaned up. That's great. Thank you, Jack. And um, I'll apologize to those questions that we didn't get to in the um, interest of trying to stick with our time frame. But um, Jack, thank you as always. I know we could do five more of these sessions with you and yes. people would still continue to come in here because we all are dealing with this. Yes. Um, well, I'm always here for you and Rutgers and my colleagues in New Jersey as well as New York. So, uh, you know, let me know how I can help and address some of the answers. You. Feel free. Stay thank you.